Psalm chapter 1, as we have been doing since it's only six verses. I'm going to read all the verses before the message, but we'll just be focusing on <coughs> one of them again this morning. The psalmist writes, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. We've been looking at this psalm, and we've been looking at the estate of the blessed man, and we're going to continue on with that theme this morning as we look at verse 3 specifically. Let's pray and ask God's blessing. Father, I ask that you would be with us this morning as we continue looking at the words of this inspired psalm. And what they uh, instruct us is important, needful, vital in the life of one who would seek to be blessed. Father, I pray this morning that you would just still our hearts in these next few moments. Uh, take from our, our minds other concerns and cares. And will we just be able to focus upon what your word says today? I pray that each person in this room desires the realities of the first part at least of this psalm, to be their own. I trust we have been able to adequately uh, reveal in the previous messages things that must be done. Now this morning, if we see the promise of this psalm, I pray that it would challenge and encourage to realize that any and all efforts would be worth it if these truths could have been ours. And so I pray this morning that you would just uh, use this time in our hearts and lives to not only equip us, but to move us further along in our in our sanctification, drawing us ever more closely to yourself and conforming us more to the image of your Son, who truly is the blessed man. And we, in and through him, can also be blessed. We thank you for this time, and we ask your blessing upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. How sad is it to see Christians who are unhappy and unfulfilled? It's sad to see people, many who I really, I can't see their hearts, but have no reason to doubt that they are truly born again. And yet, many of them seemingly are walking through this life as if there is no real hope. Their life testimony, their very words, their actions, their demeanor would lead you to believe that in their heart of hearts, they don't really believe that there can be genuine happiness or genuine fulfillment in this particular life in which they live. I think the words of our psalmist this morning really are a proverbial slap in the face to that mentality. And I really think it's written in that way. I think God at times just wants to get our attention and kind of startle us a little bit and reach in and drag us out of our lethargy and help us to realize that there is so much more that he has planned and prepared for us. If we would just get serious about the things that he said are true and seek by God's grace to order our steps in accordance with those things. The psalmist, as we've been discussing here, is speaking about a blessed man. That's the term that's used in our scriptures. We said that word carries the idea of a happy man. Although we do not know who this psalmist is, I'm, I feel fairly confident that it is uh, the psalmist's own description of his own life experience that's being written here. Many of our psalms are written by David. There's no uh, way to affirm that this is a, a Davidic psalm. But if it is, if he's speaking about his own life experience, then I think that can be helpful for us as outsiders to look at it and realize that then true happiness, this kind of blessedness that's being spoken of in here, is not dependent upon our circumstances. Because if you follow the life of King David through the scriptures, yes, he had some wonderful times and some joyous times, but man, this man's life was difficult. It was a struggle as all of God's uh, biblical characters' lives are. And yet if, he, if this is David, and after all that he's going through and all that he's experienced, he's able to say, but look, there is the ability for a man to have a blessed life. There is the ability for somebody to be happy, happy. <laughs> and I'm a living testimony of that. Then that even has a deeper meaning for us. No person's circumstances, dear friend, are ever going to be sufficient 
to provide the blessing and the happiness that this psalmist is talking about here. And if you're one of these people who is just, you know, you're convinced that in some day your, your ship's going to come in, your circumstances are going to change. You're going to find what you've been always looking for. Oh, I just, when I just find that perfect mate, my life's going to be all that I expected it to be. When God just brings children into our union, my life's going to be all that I intended it to be. When I just land that job, my life is going to be all that I want it to be. When I'm able to finally get my dream home, then my life's going to be what I want it to be. When I finally get to retire and have all of that free time that I've been looking for, my life's going to be all that I anticipated it to be. Everybody who's gone through these life experiences know that those things never bring the happiness or the joy or the fulfillment that we dreamed that they would. Because we're still living these lives in a fallen and cursed world. We're still living our lives in bodies that still are, are, are laboring under the bondage of the fallenness of man. Therefore, circumstances are never going to bring the happiness the contentment, if we want to use that term, the joy that the psalmist speaks of here, it must come from somewhere else. And we know ultimately it has to come from God. But we've been looking in this passage to realize that although it does come from God, God does seem to put certain prerequisites or requirements upon us in order to fully appreciate and realize all the blessings that he has for us. So who is this blessed man? Well, he is a man who has God's favor upon him. He is a man who knows God's smile, if you will. He is described in this psalm as a righteous or a godly man, but what does that mean? Well, as we've looked at this previously, we said we know it means that he knows who God is. He's a man who has received new life in Christ. He is, has a new inner man which is created in the image of God and is able now to have fellowship and communion with God. Not only this, he is a man who because of his new nature can now attain the knowledge of God. He's also a man who knows how to walk with God. It is not just enough to have a new nature in order to be godly. A godly man has to then exercise that new nature, if you will, and he has to purposefully live in accordance with the desires and the attributes of the new nature that God has given to him. But even that we say, but practically, Pastor, what does that mean? Well, the psalmist described the practicality of it for us in both negative and positive terms. In verse 1, he said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So negatively, if we want to look at it from that side, it means the godly man's conduct of life is consistent with the new nature he professes to possess. Therefore, he rejects the counsel. He rejects the pathway. He rejects the foolish scorning and mockery of the ungodly. No godly person can ever be comfortable or at home in the presence of people who are walking in unrighteousness. He rejects those individuals and their way of life. His only desire whatsoever is to be in the presence and, and, and the desire of, of God upon his life. And when he does find himself around the unsaved, or when he purposely puts himself in their pathway, we saw from looking at the example of Jesus Christ, it's not because he enjoys what's going on, or he wants to participate in their activities. No, he is there for the express desire of calling those people to repentance, and trying to help them to realize that there is a better life for them as well, if they would just turn their hearts and lives to God. But is that enough? Is it enough for a man to separate himself from sinful ways? Will that in of itself make a person blessed or happy, happy? And the psalmist tells us no. It takes something on the positive side as well. Verse 2, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. On a positive side, the godly man has an entirely new desire and a new influence in his life. This new desire and this new influence is the very word of God. He's described as one who delights in God's word. He deems it of great value. He takes great pleasure in God's word. We read a couple quotes from people from Old Testament past. Job said this, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth, God's mouth, more necessary than my food. David said, I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. Jesus said, if, the, if thou be the Son of God, they said, Satan said to him, if thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is the attitude of the godly person toward 
the Word of God. It is not enough for a Christian to just say, I believe God's Word, or even to read God's Word. He has to delight in God's Word. But more than simply delighting in God's Word, the godly man also, we learned last week, meditates in God's Word day and night. We looked at that word meditation, the Hebrew word that's translated meditation, and we find out that at its root, it, it really carries the idea of speaking to yourself or muttering or murmuring to yourself. The godly man is one who is continually reminding himself of God's precepts. Perhaps we could say it this way, he is one who spends his time convincing himself of God's truth or the realities of God's word concerning him. I, I like to use the term he preaches to himself, constantly telling himself, this is what's right, this is what's true, this is what's real, this is what God expects of you. Because think of it this way, the counsel of the ungodly seems sensible to our earthly understandings. The way of the life of the sinner many times as we said last week, seems to be much more prosperous than the way of life of the Christian. I know many people who do not know God who have far more, materially speaking, than I have, who seem to enjoy better health, who seem to enjoy more prosperity, who seem to have a better home life and all of these other things than even I do as a Christian. And therefore, it would be easy for me, as, as Asaph did in Psalm 73, to look on the condition of the heathen and want, begin to wonder, is it even worth it to be a child of God? Is it even worth it to follow in the precepts of God? Because look, the heathen seem to have their way, and everything seems to be going well. There seems to be no judgment upon them. Am I even doing the right thing here? The way of the world seems sensible to us if we allow ourselves to look that way. The scorning and the mocking of the ungodly can sometimes seem justifiable. Remember what Peter said in his epistle? He said, be careful. There are going to be those scoffers, those mockers at the end times that are going to say, hey, look around us. You talk about the coming of the Lord, but nothing's changed since the very beginning. <laughs> Things are still going on as they always have. And Peter says, be careful. <laughs> God's not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness. His delay is for righteous and eternal purposes. That's why the judgment has not fallen. But don't let this fact that judgment hasn't come make us think judgment isn't coming. But look, let's just be fair and honest. Do you not sometimes wonder as well, is judgment going to come? We look at some of the things that go on even in our country and the things that our politicians say and the things that they stand for and the things that they promote. How many billions of babies have to be murdered before God does something? Where is God? Is He watching? Does He care? Will He ever intervene? And it's easy for us, even as Bible-believing Christians, to begin to question and wonder, is there a God up there? Does He care? Will He do anything? And if He's not willing to do anything about this... Is he really going to do something about me and the things that I'm doing in my life? I think this is why Jesus warned in his, his earthly ministry that there is a broad pathway which is leading to destruction. And there are many multitudes of individuals who are traveling on that pathway. It seems like the way to go. But the psalmist reminds us things should not be this way for the godly man. But how does he go about changing his outlook on life? Well, he confronts the lies of sinful human reasoning with the truth of God's word. He is constantly reminding himself from God's word that though the pathway of the wicked appears to be prosperous, it's actually leading to ultimate damnation. He is constantly building his faith in God and establishing his righteousness by continually rehearsing God's own testimony through constant meditation upon the Bible. It's not just reading it. It's not even just thinking about it. It is forcing himself to take those truths and say, yes, this is true and I will live it. And when he finds himself wavering, he says, Kirk, that's not acceptable. You can't go that way because God demands something different out of you. When I find myself making decisions that are only made out of the wisdom of this world, God's word says, Kirk, that's not for you. This isn't your home anymore. Your home's up here. This isn't to be your mindset anymore. You're to have the mind of Christ. This isn't supposed to be your motivation anymore. This is your ultimate motivation. 
But how do I actually make that real and live it? I have to continue to take the truth and preach it to myself and say, Kirk, you must believe. You must follow. You must accept. You must change. You must live. And I don't know about you folks, but that's a 24-hour-a-day job for me. But if I want to have any hope of ever being happy, <laughs> any hope of ever being blessed, this psalm reminds me that will be required of me. So if I choose to reject the, the way of sinners and the counsel of the ungodly and those that are condemned, and I refuse to go that way, I separate myself from them, and then I begin to delight in God's word and I meditate on it day and night, what's that going to do for me? Calissa, again, let's just be honest. I like to try to be honest in the pulpit. Let's be honest. That's a lot of work. And it's a lot of labor. And it's a lot of sacrifice. That's why most Christians don't do it. I didn't say that's why the unsaved world doesn't do it. I'm saying that's why most Christians don't do it. There's very few blessed Christians in the light of Psalm 1. Because most Christians are enamored with this world and refuse to separate from it, and they really are not taking seriously and inculcating God's word. Therefore, they can't be blessed. We've already discussed that. But let's say out of a congregation this morning, let's say we have 50 people. Let's say two of us are serious. I'd like to think there would be more, but if we could get two, I'd be thrilled. Let's say there are two people in this auditorium who actually are serious about what this psalm teaches and actually want to do these things that God, this psalm says a godly man should do. What expectation could they possibly have if they were to commit themselves to the fulfillment of the teaching of verses 1 and 2. That's what our verse this morning is going to tell us. And we're going to look this morning at verse 3, and let me read it, and then we'll break it down and discuss it a little bit in the rest of the message. He, this godly man, this blessed man, this man who has the favor of God upon him and the smile of God upon him, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Wow. Wow. What a promise. I see five descriptions in this verse of the godly man that I want us to focus our attention upon briefly this morning. The first thing I think that we see in this beautiful picturesque language that the, uh, that the psalmist uses is the godly man will be established. The godly man will be established because he says, this man, he shall be planted like a tree, or like a tree planted. Now, when you think about even that phrase, every term the psalmist uses is beautiful and insightful. The first thing in this psalm is that he likens the godly man to a tree. And when you stop and think about a tree, in light maybe of what we're discussing here, there are some beautiful and interesting things that come to our minds. The first thing when you think about a tree is this. There's the idea of an endurance. As opposed to the flowers or the grass or other vegetation, the tree is one of the few specimens of the plant world that actually lives for a relatively long period of time. Actually, the Bible actually uses the withering element of grass to talk about the futility of life and the, 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 the quickness of it all. You know, as the grass withereth and the flower fadeth away, but my word shall stand forever. So in that sense, when we think of just the creative world that God has given us, uh, you know, the grass and the flowers, they come and they go. We were just on this trip back from Texas and through several sections of the interstate there in Texas, there were these beautiful fields of wildflowers. And I don't know what they were, but they were beautiful blues and reds and yellows. And they were just gorgeous to look at, but you know what? They're not going to last very long. They're going to be gone. Enjoy them while they're there, because they won't be long. And in this sense, we see that the tree element here has endurance. There are many trees that live hundreds of years. And I think this aspect of the description here reminds us of the fact that the godly man can be one who will endure. Now, we know that even... The scriptures would help us to understand that a, a, a man's life is not to be wrapped up in this previous, you know, this present earthly existence. But there's many times, isn't it interesting that the Bible used as a blessing to individuals who are honoring him long life and, and pro, you know, good years and all these kind of things. There is a sense in which God does tend to, it's a general truth, but tends to bless those who honor him. And one of the blessings is, is to give them a long life here on this earth. 
And then when he thinks of the tree planted by the rivers of water, I think there is this element of endurance. But the blessing is the, under, the blessed man understands this. If he is truly rightly related to God through Jesus Christ, then he truly will endure. Because even when this earthly sojourn is over, even if it's been a long one, <laughs> he's going to live for eternity with God and enjoy all the blessings that are there. So it is an enduring element of this godly man. But I think also in this, in this idea of thinking about it being a tree is maybe stateliness, if you will. Other plants are oftentimes more beautiful than the trees, but few are as stately or as majestic as the trees. The trees, and if you think of it in this sense, tower above the earth. They're kind of above the fray, if you will, of what's going on down below in the earthly life. And perhaps that's kind of the description or the use of a tree in this element is, you know, when we're actually walking with God, when we're actually doing the things that God has asked us to do, when our mindset is actually where God wants it to be, does that not enable us to, in a sense, rise above it all? To kind of be above the fray of what's going on here on earth? Isaiah likened it to the idea of being mounting up with wings as eagles. You know, that kind of just ability to soar above it all. It's not that we're not engaged. It's not that we're not in, impacted and even infected at times by the things that are going down here on this earth. But there is a sense in which when you think of the tree, it's high, it's towering, it's above it all. And maybe that's what the psalmist wants us to see. We're like a tree planted. We have this ability to kind of rise above things because of our relationship to God and because of our mindset being where God has placed it. But I think also in a tree, we might think of the idea of being anchored. When you think of it as a tree, is it as impressive often as the visible part of the tree, maybe more remarkable or even impressive is the portion of the tree that we never see. The part that's under the ground. The rooted element, if you will. It's amazing to watch a grand old tree in a strong windstorm. And it weaves and it bows and it bends and it creaks and it does all these things. But if it's healthy and it's strong and it has a good root system, it usually is able to stand. It will also enable the tree to survive periods of drought when water is in short supply, but because that tree has an extensive root system that goes deep and goes far, it's able to extract moisture from the earth and able to sustain itself even in very difficult times. And perhaps that is one of the things that, that the psalmist is bringing out here when he describes the blessed man as a tree. He's a man who's anchored. The storms of life don't blow the blessed man around. They don't destroy his life. He's anchored and he's able to sustain and stand in very difficult and trying times. And we will all face those. We know that. I think also perhaps wrapped up in the idea of a description of the tree might be the thing, the idea of refuge. How many other species of insects and wildlife animals find their safety and find their refuge within the confines of a tree? Think back over your Christian experience and ask yourself, how many times have you been blessed by a godly person? When it seemed like your world was falling apart and you were falling apart along with it, all of a sudden you just found this Christian who's just an anchor. And you're able to come to that person and that person is able to kind of just envelop you in their arms. They're able to, to, to come and, and to share with you some of the truths that they have learned from God to sustain you in a very difficult time. They're able to provide a little bit of strength for you in the midst of your weakness. And when you think of being that godly person that God enables to, to learn and grow and understand and function within the truths of, of God's own person in their lives, and as they go through their earthly sojourn, God is going to enable them to be useful in the lives of others who need that stability and need that strength and need that guidance and need that wisdom and need that help when they're in a difficult time in their lives. This godly man is not simply a tree, though. He's a tree that's planted. The godly man in his present condition did not come by chance, nor was it simply the inheritance of his own inward goodness. The godly man is a tree planted because the owner of the orchard has planted him himself. God plants you. And as we are established in him, God has his purposes for our lives. And as we walk in obedience and conformity to his way, God himself will plant us like a tree. As we go forward, though, and look at this description, I think we also learn here that the godly man is nurtured. He says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. You know, although God has created certain species of trees which can survive in drought conditions, the psalmist seems to be painting a picture of the lushness and the vitality of this particular tree. All trees are going to need water to flourish and grow, and this tree has been planted by the order of the orchard, by a river, and not just any river, by the rivers of waters. 
What does the godly man need to grow, to thrive, to be strong, and to be healthy? Well, whatever is needed, the godly man is going to have provided for him because he is planted by the rivers of waters. I can't help but think of Jesus' words to the woman at the well as she was coming to draw and they were speaking to one another and Jesus said, Whosoever drinketh of this water, speaking of Jacob's well, will thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. No wonder the godly man is so happy. Because he's a person who never lacks what is truly needed for his nourishment and his vitality. He is planted by the rivers of waters. So he's nourished. Thirdly, I think we see here that the godly man will be fruitful. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Because God has planted us within his orchard and because he is nurturing us and giving us everything that we need to be healthy and to thrive, we now are in a position to bear fruit. Jesus said in John 15, 8, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. Every godly person will bear fruit. You say, well, what kind of fruit will they bear? Well, there may be various types, and the Bible seems to speak of various types of fruit, but I would think at least for this morning's purposes we could say this, that each godly person will bear the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians, we read about this fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. These attributes of God cannot help but be produced in the life of all godly people who are walking with God on a regular basis in His Word. The psalmist describes this as his fruit in his season. And it's kind of interesting, perhaps the psalmist is seeking to describe even a personal element to this fruit bearing. The godly man will experience God's fruit in his own personal life. In other words, the godly man is going to be equipped by God to accomplish God's purposes for his own life and, and is for the glory that God expects to get from his life. And his fruit as he's going to produce will be in his season. And I think that's helpful and descriptive as well, because just as natural trees bear fruit at certain times and seasons, other times are used by the tree to take in food, water, energy from the sun, to prepare themselves to produce fruit when they're called upon again by God. And so the Christian may not appear at times to be as fruitful in every season of life, but he will, if living in a godly way, be continually enriched so that when the times come, he will be able to bring forth the fruit that God desires to produce in and through his life. So he is able to produce fruit in his season. And I think also we learn here, fourthly, that the godly man will be sustained. His leaf also, the psalmist says, shall not wither. I don't know whether the psalmist had in mind some sort of an evergreen tree, or whether he is simply stressing the health and vitality of the tree is going to remain constant. But in either case, the tree is one that will remain, he says. Kind of alluded to this earlier, but when you think about the life of a tree, it's interesting when you cut down a tree or look at cut logs and to observe the growth rings in that particular tree. And you can see really kind of a history of that particular tree is expressed in the growth rings. You can count the rings up, if you will, and figure out how old that particular tree is. You can see as you examine those growth rings that some are wider or narrower than others, that is, it experienced sizable growth and maturity in certain years and seasons, and then in other years, it doesn't appear to have grown much at all. These changes give us a hint of the environmental conditions that the tree has faced during a particular year and what it's had to endure through its life. The godly man also will go through varying seasons of growth as well. Some years, this godly man is going to grow by leaps and bounds. He's going to experience and understand it. Others, seeing his life, are going to observe the incredible growth and maturity that God is bringing into this individual's life because of the way he's walking with God and obeying his precepts. But that very same man, even in the same seasons and going through the same types of obedience and, and fulfillment of God's will and purpose, might prove to have years of growth that seem more muted. Perhaps years that we might consider years of self-introspection. Times not so much of outward growth, but maybe inward maturity. Times where he's feasting on the Word just as much. He's, he's, he's seeking to live the purified and separated life just as much. But it's not accomplished as much outwardly as to what God is trying to do to him inwardly. 
And sometimes there has to be those seasons of inward growth in order to prepare us to be useful for God in outward capacities in ministry. And perhaps that's what's being seen here. While we must be honest and admit that the godly, the ungodly, even an unsaved do at times experience what appears to be outwardly fruitful and abundant times, the scriptures remind us that the truth of the matter is the unsaved are at their very best sickly and dying spiritually. And they will eventually succumb to the disease of sin within. Their leaf, though maybe vibrant at the moment, will eventually wither and fall to the ground. Their existence will become that of a rotting, decaying shell of itself until it completely passes off of the scene. The godly man, though, the psalmist says, will be sustained by God. Sustained through good times and through bad. Sustained through easy times and hard times. Able to glorify and honor God through times of sickness as well as times of health. He will remain for the Lord himself, and the Lord himself will sustain him. And then fifthly, I think we see about this description here, the godly man will prosper. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I would think most of us in this room this morning know that this statement of the psalmist is not to be regarded as if God is some sort of a genie that the godly man keeps in a bottle who basically gives the godly man whatever he desires. But the psalmist does inform us that God himself will see to the prosperity of the godly man and the things that he attempts to do will prosper because God is with him. How does this actually work? Well, keep your finger here. Let's turn ahead to Psalm 37 and read another psalm and a statement concerning this that I think gives us insight into the way this is, should actually be thought about in our lives. Psalm chapter 37. David here is the psalmist and obviously giving some insight into his own experience. If we started in verse 1, he says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. You know, but aren't we so prone to that? David, I'm sure, was prone as well, but he's preaching to himself. He's telling himself, don't get caught up in being envious of these evil workers. Why? Verse 2, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and they will wither as the green herb. How does he know that? How does he know that's going to be the case? Well, you might say well, some by observance, and we can and by observance, but we lose sight of that because it doesn't happen quick enough usually at times in our lives to have the impact that we need. How did he know that? This is what God had said. Not only the historical portions of God's word that had revealed it to him, but the very promises and teachings of God in his word that David was obviously feeding himself with, nourishing himself with over and over again, he understood this to be the case. Then he goes on in verse 3 and he says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. I, I, I like this psalm because I think it helps us to understand the way in which this works. Because David says here, he says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Does God give the godly man the desires of the heart? Yes, he does. But the godly man's desires are different than they used to be. The godly man's desires have now been converted to the desires of God himself. Therefore, when he commits himself to the Lord, the desires of God become his, and then God gives him the desires of his heart, or he brings them to pass. Similar to what Jesus said. He said, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it will be done unto you. I've heard Christians claim that promise and say, I'm claiming Jesus' words here, and I'm asking for this, whatever it may be that I want, and God is going to give it to me because Jesus promised those things. Well, he promised that in a context, that if we abide in him, and his words are abiding in us, then we can ask what we will, and he will give it unto us. But what we ask for now are going to be changed and transformed by abiding in his will and his word abiding in us. That's what changes the whole dynamic. So he's not giving us a blank check. He's informing us that since our desires are now consistent with his desires, we can have complete confidence in asking for the things that we desire because they're his desires already and he will bring them to pass. That's what our psalmist is saying. The godly man who delights in God's word, the one who meditates in God's word day and night, is a man who is transformed by that word. And then he will be seeking to accomplish the will of God and God will prosper him in every effort that he has to obey God's word. God said it many times. He said it very similarly to Joshua as he was preparing Joshua to go in and lead the nation into the promised land. In Joshua 1.8, he said, This book 
shall not depart out of the law, out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. If Joshua would take the law, the book of the law of the Lord, if he would meditate in it day and night, if he would allow its truths and precepts to change him, then it would make his way prosperous and would assure Joshua of the success that God had prepared for his life. Folks, when you think about what the psalmist is writing here, no wonder this individual is happy, happy. No wonder he's blessed. No wonder he's a man who, on a regular basis, senses the very smile or favor of God upon him in his life. Why? Why does he live this way? Why is he experiencing these things? Why is this the desire of his heart? Why is he happy, happy? Well, number one, because he's avoided sinners in their ways. Folks, listen, when we are not willing to take the, the, the proactive steps, the necessary steps to do everything within our power to separate ourselves from the influence of the ungodly and their sinful ways, we can never know this favor of God. We can never experience this type of happiness that Jesus is, or that the psalmist is describing here in our passage. It's just an impossibility. So if you want to continue to live your life enamored with the world around you, infected, if you will, by the world around you, immersed in the culture that's all around you, fine, go that way. I'm not saying it's going to keep you out of heaven one day. That's between you and the Lord. But I can, based upon this psalm, tell you, you are never going to experience this happiness, this favor, this smile of God upon your life. It's an impossibility. It can't be when your life is immersed in the sinful ways and you're more than happy and content to be there. This man is also happy because he delights himself in God's word and he meditates on it day and night. Dear friend, if this book is more of a drudgery to you than a blessing, you're never going to know the happiness of God. If your time spent in God's Word is that thing that you have to force yourself to do, you have to schedule it, and you have to pressure yourself to spend time in it, you are never going to know the happiness and the joy and the contentment that this psalmist is speaking of here. This book has to be something that you have come to understand is more necessary to you than physical food, sleep, a job, money, anything. That God and His truth is the most precious treasure that you possess. Until we get to the point where that is what we really understand and are experiencing and trying to follow after, we can never know the kind of favor that the psalmist is speaking of here. It's just an impossibility. But if we are willing to follow that pathway, then the psalmist reminds us it will be worth it. Because we will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in his season. Our leaf will not wither, and whatsoever we undertake for God will prosper. So I wonder this morning, are you a blessed individual? And if you're not this morning, do you desire to be? Don't fall for the lies of Satan and don't fall for the lies of this world. And don't fall for the lies of the majority of nominal Christians that would like to help you to believe that this type of experience is not available to you. That it's not real. Dear friend, if they're telling the truth, then our God is a liar. God's word says that you can experience this type of blessing. And it can be yours. But it does not happen by chance. It is very purposeful. And I wonder this morning, perhaps God has already been at work in your heart in this area. Perhaps just spending the last few Sundays contemplating the truths of this first psalm has got you thinking and got you wondering and maybe even got you thinking a little bit about, I wonder what it would be like to experience those things. I wonder if it's true. I wonder if it's possible. I wonder if it could be me. Yeah, I've read about others. We're putting these missionary biographies, little snippets in our bulletins here recently. Yeah, I've read these his historical figures of times past and the blessings of God upon their life and, and the, the things that they were able to accomplish and the, the joy that they say that they experienced in their relationship with God. I understand that others seem to have experienced, but is it, every, is it really possible for me? Could that be me? Could I be that happy in the Lord? 
If that's a question you're asking yourself and it's a desire that you want, then I can I encourage you this morning to take hold of what this psalm is telling you and start putting it into practice. Would you be willing to take the negative steps of separating yourself from these sinful and wicked influences? Would you be willing to take these positive steps of delighting in God's word and meditating in it day and night? And then perhaps several weeks, months, years from now, you can come back and share with us your own testimony about how you were like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth his fruit in his season. Your leaf also shall not wither, but whatsoever you doeth, it prospers. Shouldn't that be the testimony of every Christian? Shouldn't that be the desire of the heart of every individual in this room this morning if they claim to be Christ's? Is it a promise that God has only made for a select few? Or is it a truth that is delivered to everyone who desires it? What would it be like to be a blessed man? What would it be like to be a member of a blessed church? What impact for God could we make in this world if we were walking like the individual described in this psalm? May the Lord give us a desire for it. May the Lord bring it to pass. Father, this morning I pray you challenge us with these thoughts. Father, I pray you would challenge us with the testimony of your word. Each of us are at a different place in our experience with you, Lord. There's no doubt about that. So I don't even pretend to know where each person this morning stands with you and the, the most pressing need upon their own hearts and lives. But I, in light of this very simple and basic message of this psalm, I would believe that there are some in this room this morning, that their greatest need right now is to get serious about living the righteous and holy life that you've called them to live in this sin-cursed world. And to be willing to admit to you and to themselves that they are far too immersed in this sinful culture and that by your grace they would begin to take very definite steps to begin to pull themselves out of it. Maybe for some they need to give up entertainments Maybe for some, they need to stop reading certain types of literature. Maybe for some, they need to quit visiting certain websites or listening to certain radio broadcasts or attending certain events or hanging out with certain people. I don't know what it might be for them. I can only know what it is for me. But Lord, I pray if there are some in this room this morning that your spirit has been at work in their heart and they're serious about these things and they know this is a step they need to take. And Lord, they would be willing by your grace to commit themselves to working this out in their own life and beginning to take those definitive steps of action that would put them in a position that they would not be so negatively impacted by the sinners around them. And Lord, perhaps there are others in this room that their greatest need this morning is to reacquaint themselves with your word. And Father, they have lost their delight in your word and they need to get it back. Father, they need to commit themselves once again to this book, realizing whether they feel like it in their heart or not, realizing that it is the most precious treasure that they possess. And they would honor it not by just speaking about it, but they would honor it by immersing it in their own hearts and lives. Father, as they read and as they study and as they think, that they would allow its truths and precepts to begin to then transform their life. And they would confront the false reasonings and the false thoughts and the temptations and the desires that are so prevalent within them. They would begin confronting them with your truth and obeying and walking in your precepts and truths. Father, perhaps there's some in this room that they are in need of both of those X, and at the same time, maybe one more than the other. But Lord, this morning I also pray that we would be challenged to realize that the labor that is involved, the effort that is involved, is worth it, based upon what the psalmist describes will be the condition of those who are truly blessed. May it, Father, may it be our desire to be like these trees planted by the rivers of living water, bringing forth fruit in our season, leaves not withering, and prospering in everything that we seek to do for you. Lord, may that be the case. May you do it. In our hearts we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.